Okay, I guess we can start now. So welcome everybody. This is Entity Storage, the Drupal 8 way, and I am Francesco Placella, Plach on Dido Actually, in this session, we will see uh, a couple of code examples, but we will also see, uh, we'll talk about lots of theory, so don't scare, be scared about that. You don't need to understand every single slide you will see. There's a blog post that's uh, basically uh, providing all the information we'll be talking about here on the Drupal Watchdogs website. And then we'll have also the usual question and answer moment. So if you have any doubt, feel free to ask or feel free to interrupt if you need clarifications. Uh, just uh, one single question. Um, anyone here not familiar with the concepts of entity type definition or field definition? Great, then we'll have fun. So, a note about me. I'm Francesco Placella, Plach on Dirodo, as I said. I'm currently senior performance engineer at Taiwan Consulting, and I've been working with Drupal since 2006. I'm the official maintainer of the core language system and the core language content and translation modules. And actually, I'm also the unofficial maintainer of the Entity storage form and translation subsystems. You can find me on Twitter on the platch underscore underscore handle. So a brief outline of the session. We will see a um, comparison, quick comparison between the status of Drupal 7 versus the status of Drupal 8. Then we'll have a look to the recommended ways to deal with entity data in D8. We'll have a, a brief uh, recap of the theory behind the entity type and field definitions for those few that are not familiar with that. And then we will dive into how score storage schema is uh, handled in D8 and a deeper dive into the core SQL implementation we have in core. And then the fun stuff. The, we will see some code and we will see it uh, live working. So, Drupal 7 versus Drupal 8. In Drupal 7, we used to have what's called swappable storage f just for fields, which means that basically you could assign a dedicated storage backend to each field attached to any entity type. This meant that uh, every field could, could live in a separate storage backend, such as NoSQL storage or, a, for instance, a remote storage, you name it. And these had some drawback, actually, because the possibility to uh, configure different backends for different fields attached to the same entity type implies you may run in trouble when you need to query across those two fields, with, when you need conditions that uh, actually apply to those two fields, because you would end up querying across different storage backends, and that's not exactly viable. So. Um, this was uh, also um, related to another problem that we used to have in Drupal 7, that these, all this fancy stuff could be done only for fields. That is, data that was stored through uh, fields defined by the field module. So any, uh, anything stored in properties, entity properties, like, for instance, the node title, it, were out of luck, were forced to be stored in uh, the was regular SQL storage. In the height, uh, in the situation changed quite a lot. We switched from field-based storage to entity-based storage, which means that all fields on an entity type share the same storage, and so uh, and the whole storage is swappable, which means that the whole entity can be stored in a, stor in a storage backend, and that the storage backend can change. Um, the uh, note that we should make is that actually base fields are also supported, which means that, for instance, node title are stored uh, along with the f regular fields we were used to, like, I don't know, field body. And this means that actually um, you can swap the entire storage of the entity. And as we've seen before, you can store an entire node into Mongo storage, for instance. This makes entity query way easier because we have a single storage backend to target. 
and as a consequence, we no longer allow field, fields to be shared across entity types. So you can no longer have field, uh, I don't know, a field tags field that applies to a node type and the, to the, I don't know, user entity type, for instance. Uh, this was used to cause quite some problem in Drupal 7 because, for instance, we have permissions that in theory allows you to uh, configure the same field even if you wouldn't be able maybe to configure the same field on, on the user and instead you are allowed to configure it on node. So it, it can also create some problems. We removed that feature and actually we left the possibility to have fields named the same way and attach it to different entity types, but these are actually seen by the system as different fields. On the other hand, we are still able to, I don't know, uh, provide the same theming for those because the name is the same. So, now let's talk a bit about uh, the recommended ways to deal with uh, swappable storage. So, swap swappable storage means that we cannot assume we, we, will we will always deal with SQL anymore. Swappable backends actually uh, require different approaches re uh, depending on whether we are dealing with contrib code or custom code. For contrib code, we should never assume a SQL storage because we have no control on what storage are configured for our entity types. So we should try to leverage the Entity Crowd API for each, uh, every time we are accessing entity data. And if we really cannot help assuming a storage, we should do that in a way that allows us to write code that targets a storage, different storages. I mean, what I mean. Views, for instance, implements a query backend that targets SQL but has an API that allows to write another query backend that target Mongo, for instance, or uses the entity query API that we'll see in a moment. So if you need to target a specific uh, storage backend, please do uh, architect your code in a way that allows you to provide also alternative, uh, to support alternative storages. Instead, custom code May, may make assumption because uh, usually custom code perfectly knows the environment it will be deployed in. So actually um, is allowed to deal with, specifically deal with SQL if it needs to, but it should not bypass the entity API, which means it should not query partial entity data. It should always actually do what the entity query API does, which is retrieving the IDs of the entities that needs to be handled and load them. Loading is the only recommended way to deal with entity data because if you do, don't do that, you will run in trouble and we will see them in a moment. So um, what's the Entity Query API? The Entity Query API is the successor of the Entity Field Query API we, we used to have in Drupal 7. It's, uh, it has a much more uh, easier and streamlined syntax, which is really close now to the DBT engine one. So writing queries, uh, writing entity queries will look uh, very familiar to those who are already used to use uh, DBT engine. It, uh, as in the seven, it leverages swappable query backends that are uh, actually related, tied to the storage backends that uh, are configured for a specific entity type. So actually you can plug as many query backend as you need to support as many query backends you are using in your site. And the, uh, the, the syntax, the query will remain the same. Uh, a very powerful feature that the Drupal 8 entity query API has with respect to the 7 is the ability to express relationships between entity types, which means that we can basically uh, uh, say that we, for instance, want to uh, impose a condition on the status of the author of a node, okay? We are crossing the boundaries of two entity types and as long as those are stored in the same storage backend, we will be able to query across them. And obviously in SQL this translates to a join, but in other storage backends, we can have whatever we need to express the same relationship. 
Another cool feature is that we now support aggregated queries. So that gives us a very wide range of queries we are able to express just with entity query, which means we have portable code that can work on any storage backend. All of this is very powerful. Obviously, we have not the degree of expressiveness that SQL has. So if you still need to write a SQL query, you're allowed to do so. But please, please, don't load partial data. Don't write partial data. Use your queries to retrieve entity identifiers and load them, and then deal with them, and then save them again. Because if you don't do that, you're basically bypassing the entity API, which means that you may run into unexpected behaviors because all the hooks that are involved in the load and store processes are bypassed. And so every module that's assuming uh, your code will always, will, uh, your entities will always run through that uh, hooks implementations will be basically bypassed too. And then you might have cache invalidation issues because uh, now we have entity cache baked into core. And so if you write data directly on the storage, you're bypassing that and you will run into caching issues. So do whatever you need to do, but do it the right way. And if you really need to write your own uh, SQL-specific code, please at least wrap it into a service so that can be swapped out. And if needed, uh, an alternative implementation supporting different storage backends can be provided. So now, a brief recap of entity type definition and field definition concepts. An entity type definition is a way to inform the system that we have actually a new entity type. It's a plugin, not more, no less, a plugin definition. So if you are not very familiar with that concept, there was a nice introductory section uh, by Eclipse ZC yesterday, unfortunately. So uh, you can have a look to the video. And these plugins, these, sorry, entity type definition, allow to specify in core mainly two different entity types. We will focus on the first one, the content entity types, because those are the ones that are actually fieldable. Instead, we have also configuration entity types that we won't see here. Uh, those are, for instance, node types or views. They share the same basic API uh, the content entity uh, have, but actually don't deal with fields. They have plain properties. Um, although even these properties share a tiny bit of API with fields, but they are not full-fledged fields. So the main properties we have in this definition, the entity type definition, is the handler sections that allow to define two handlers that are very important, are critical to the entity storage API, which are the storage handler, which is what in the seven used to be the controller, and this is in, uh, in charge of performing all the CRUD operations, not only the load operation we had in D7. And then we have an optional storage schema handler that is in charge to handle uh, the actual storage schema. <laughs> Surprise. So this is not required. Uh, you need to specify it only if the storage backends you're dealing with actually require a schema. If they have no such concept, you can skip it. The two, main, uh, the two most important properties of the entity type definition are revisionability and translatability because they actually determine which data we will need to store and how it will be stored. So it basically affect, have, have a great impact on the final schema. Instead, uh, the entity field API, which actually is the, the API that uh, generalized the concept of the D7 field API and relies on field definitions, and actually provided a great leap ahead with respect to the D7, because actually now every piece of code, that, oh sorry, every piece of data that's attached to an entity is actually a field. So even a node title, a node type, a node identifier, uh, a common parent ID or stuff, everything is a field basically, which means that, as I said before, everything can be swapped, everything can integrate flawlessly with 
views, rest, or whatever else uh, feature that uh, properly integrates with the Entity L Field API. We, we still have a distinction, which is more or less maps to the uh, properties and fields, the, uh, fields the distinction we had in D7, but it's actually uh, slightly different. Uh, we have base fields, which are the ones, more or less the ones we were used to consider properties in D7, like the node ID, that are shared across all the bundles of an entity type. Instead, we have bundle fields that are attached or may be attached to only certain bundles, and this is the case of Right, usually the case of field that uh, created through the field UI. So uh, field body is shared across all entity types usually, but can be removed. A field image is attached only to certain bundles. So these are more, way more flexible, let's say, and are not required because there is no business logic built upon them. Specifically, how we, do we tell the system we have field definitions? The ba very basic field definitions, the ones that came nat come natively with the entity type, for instance, the node type, the node, ID, the node identifier again, are provided by the class <coughs> defining the entity type itself. So node, the node class has a method providing the definition for the fields it uses. We have these two hooks, hook entity base field info and hook entity bundle info to define additional field definitions. And we have the corresponding alter hooks. Base field, additional base field definitions are usually defined in core, in code, sorry. Because typically those are used to implement additional business logic. Uh, an example may be the scheduler module that needs additional fields to determine whether scheduling is enabled. Uh, no, sorry. Um, Yes, scheduling is enabled for a specific node, let's say. And yes, that's a case where all the code is written assuming the field is there, and so the definition is provided in code. Instead, uh, the bundle fields, as I said, uh, are optional, are way more dynamic, and usually are defined through the field UI, although since we have a hook, any, any, any module can define additional bundle fields. Um, and those typically in core live in configuration because the field module, the field UI module, and the field module share the same configuration, we write that configuration, and then the field module implement that, but the bundle and the hook entity bundle field info hook, and uh, basically define, provides the definition based on the configuration it has. We have another concept you may not familiar with, which is field storage definitions. This roughly maps to the distinction we had in the seven between field and in, in instances. What we've seen so far are instances. To, I mean, field definitions are roughly in what we call instances in the seven, and instead, what we roughly call field uh, uh, in the seven are field storage definitions, which actually are the collection of properties required to store surprise <laughs> the the field and. Uh, uh, this information is shared among all bundles, if you are talking about a bundle field, and actually are part of the definition if you are talking about the base field, because actually a base field is shared across all bundles, so it's actually at the same time both a field definition and a field storage definition. These storage definition are what actually uh, are actually used to determine the storage schema, which is the big news, or one of the big news we have in the Entity Storage API, which means that the storage now completely automatically takes care of creating, removing, updating the storage schema without the developer needing to do anything about that. That's completely autom automated and is completely based on the definitions we have seen so far. Entity type definition and field storage definition. Provide those and the system will figure the rest out for you. So how does it work? As we, we've seen we, through the entity type definition, we define a storage schema handler, which is nothing more a class that's re responsible to translate 
the entity type and field defini definition to a schema definition in the typical case we have in core in a schema API definition. This schema is automatically generated when the module defining the entity type is installed and is automatically dropped when the module is uninstalled. The same is true also for modules providing additional fields. So if your scheduler module is adding a base field to the node module and you install it, the, the field column will be created automatically on the shared on the table of the, of the node if we are in core and we are dealing with the SQL storage. Actually, let's have a look uh, to how the core SQL storage looks like. In core, we have generated tables for both base and bundle fields. All the single cardinality base fields are stored in shared tables, which means that there are a column in a table and all of those live in the same table. That's why they are called shared. Instead, for bundle fields, we have dedicated tables, the usual field tables we are used to have in D7. So, but this concept is extended also to um, multiple cardinality base fields. So even fields that are shared across all bundles are stored in dedicated tables if they are multiple, and we will see that in a moment. The core uh, SQL storage handler supports four different table layouts depending on the properties uh, we've seen before, revisionability or translatability. So let's have a quick look to how these four table layouts look like. Um, let me know whether you can hear me because now I have to turn my head a bit. So the first, ex the first example we have is the entity test. Okay, uh, a simple entity type that is not translatable nor revisionable. As you can see, all the base fields are stored in a single table, are columns in a single table. And then we have a custom, uh, sorry, a configurable field, a bundle field that's in its own uh, dedicated table. And you, as you can see, the, the schema is pretty much the same as we used to have in D7. The only column that it's not there anymore is the entity type column because now fields are tied to an entity type, so we don't need to specify that. And as you can see, uh, the naming scheme has changed a bit. We will, we will now have a prefix. Uh, of the entity type name, so actually it's easier to see all the fields that are attached to a specific entity type. We now have um, a multilingual entity type, and this is the base table. The base table only has just a few very basic non-translatable values, namely ID, UUID, bundle, and LAN code. And then we have the, sorry, the data table, that actually store the field data and does it by, by language. So you have multiple language version of the same data. We have revisionable entity types that instead have a base table that stores all the field data and a revision table that stores uh, the revisions of that data. And then we have uh, the usual dedicated tables, and in this case we have also the revision table, which is not there if the entity type is not revisionable, as you can see here and here. And then we finally we have the most complex entity type, which is, for instance, the same uh, table layout we have for nodes, that these are both translatable and revisionable, and they have four tables. The base table that, again, has only a few columns that are very specific and not translatable. Then we have um, a field data table that holds actually all the field data, and this is translatable. And then we have the revision table that holds only some few uh, information about the revisionable field, uh, the revisions, sorry. And then we have the, sorry, here it is the field revision table that holds all the revision of actually all the field data. And these are our four uh, table layouts. Actually, as you can imagine, these are 
quite complex, and so it's really nice that the system takes care automatically of all of that, and you don't have to remember these details, because it will work automatically, and the system will do it for you. So next. Yeah, what does this mean uh, from a developer point of view? This means that we can no longer assume a table layout. Besides, we can no longer assume a, a storage backend. And so if you are writing contrib code, as I said, you should just use the entity query API and the SQL backend, the SQL query backend of the entity query API knows about this stuff and will figure it out for you. You don't need to worry about that. Just specify your conditions as you would have and you're fine. If you instead need to write SQL specific code that still cannot make assumptions on the SQL backend, you have this new table mapping API that it's a very simple API that allows to describe which tables are used and what fields are stored in this table. And it can be used to write dynamic queries that don't need to make assumptions on the SQL storage. It's, in core, it's mainly used by the views, um, by the views module to implement its SQL backend in a way that supports all the four table layouts we just saw. Um, the goal of this table mapping API is to be generic enough to describe any table layout, but we didn't re got so far at the moment. We just have a default table mapping implementation that assumes one of the four table layouts we just saw. But it should be enough uh, to work with all of these if you don't have to create your, all your crazy table layouts. And if you need to do well, you are welcome to join us in implementing the rest. Okay, I told you, I mentioned that actually uh, it's possible to update the scheme aside from creating and dropping it at module installation and installation. How does this work? Uh, again, the system is able to update in its, the schema completely automatically. You just need to uh, tell it to do so. Um, and you do that through the Entity Definition Update Manager, which is a service that's available also on the Drupal class, and allows you to tell the system that you performed a change in the entity type or field, defini field storage definitions, and so the schema needs to be updated to reflect those changes. One, impor one important thing to say is that the system won't proceed if the change you are uh, specifying will imply a data migration. This is not supported, it was not supported in the seven if you tried to change uh, some properties of the field when there was already data, the system will just refuse to proceed. And you can imagine this system as an extension of that concept actually, that is available also on the API level. Typically these entity updates are used in DB update, a regular DB update function, and we will see a couple of those in, in a few moments. So basically, once your module create, has a new version that, I don't know, for instance, adds a new, defines a new uh, base field, for instance, you just uh, have to write a DB update function that notifies the system that you've, had added, you've defined a new base field, and the system will update the schema for you. You don't need to do anything more than just tell the system that you did that. The system could actu is actually able to tell there are differences and deal with them automatically. There's a rush command to do that. But you should, no, you should use that only while developing. In production environments, a status report item indicating there's a mismatch between the definition and the actual schema is a sign something is wrong with the code is, uh, you've deployed, actually. And that code is responsible to provide DB functions to uh, tell the system to update the, the definitions. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, applying in bulk all the changes required to reconcile the definition with the schema is, uh, uh, may lead to unpredictable results because uh, it will take the differences introduced by all the modules that are installed in your system. Instead, applying single updates from every module responsible for the changes introduced is a way to ensure consistency in, up, in the update process. So now let's have a look to the thing 
Uh, I mean, all of, all of what uh, we talk about so far is theory is important, but it's not something we will probably deal with every day. Let's have a look to the actual meaty part, so the right way. What you should really uh, take away from this session. You actually need to define your business model through the entity type and field definitions. And then, as I said, all the data, all the entity field data will be loaded and stored automatically for you. You will gain automatic integration uh, with views, REST, rules, and whatever exploits the entity field API correctly. You will get automatic revision, uh, revisionability and translatability support for free, completely for free, as long as you uh, keep uh, exploiting the core system, the core API. If for any reason you don't, you cannot use for your field the storage provided by the API natively, sorry, you can specify that uh, your field definition has a custom storage, which means the, the system will, won't do anything automatically for that. It will just ignore it, basically, and uh, Actually, this is mainly used for custom, uh, for computed fields that are not, uh, don't not, uh, do not need to be stored, actually. So they are computed live. But you can do that to provide your own storage. Keep it, just keep in mind that at that point, you are on your own, and you will need to, for instance, provide uh, alternative storage backends if that's required, because the system will just basically ignore your field. Once you have defined your data model, so you've just provided a few entity type and field definitions. Code around it. Biz build your business logic around it. Core does that. Actually, it provides an interface making the business logic explicit for each entity type. For, so for instance, we have the node interface for nodes, which defines a bunch of uh, accessors for the node fields that are doing nothing more than formalizing that those fields are required and are what's needed to implement the node business logic, the node default business logic. This is, is a good thing because it also allows to encapsulate this logic. So, for instance, if you have an entity type and you know you will have a field with some business logic attached with that, but you don't have to, the time to implement the field or uh, you don't have to, uh, you don't want to do that in that specific moment, you can still uh, put it on the interface, provide, I don't know, an empty implementation. You can already write all the code that uses that interface, and then you can provide the, uh, the implementation later. And that's a, a good programming practice. Another advantage is that this approach uh, makes uh, working with IDEs way better. So it, you will have auto-completion, and uh, everything will be way easier to write. And in a sense, you are also making clear what uh, your required data model, because everything that's on the interface is what your code is actually needing to work, aside from the other APIs it integrates with. Uh, it's a good practice to replicate uh, this situation core provides and provide a wrapper for entities. We will see that. We will see what I mean. So that if you're adding new base fields, you have your own accessors for those fields. So basically, you provide a small class that's wrapping the entity class, and it's providing simple methods that allow you to access uh, the fields you, you have defined in a more strict way, and you get the same gains I was listing earlier for the core interfaces. So I guess uh, enough talking. Let's see some code. So we will see uh, an example of a module that just wants to display a, a stupid list of users that uh, have created at least a single, uh, at least one published node, the amount, uh, total amount of created nodes, and the title of the node that was uh, most recently recently created. This uh, may be quite tricky to implement actually with a single query because uh, it might imply quite some joints and uh, an aggregated query. So as, long, as soon as the numbers of users and nodes go up and you start having many of them, the query will perform quite badly. 
So a typical approach to solve this is the normalization. You add new columns to the table to be queried, and you store data that allows you to obtain the same result but performing a way faster query. So what we will do in this example, we'll add two fields to the user entity type that will store the data we need to perform this query. And then we update those through the regular CRUD uh, uh, events the Entity API provides, namely the classic hood node insert and hood node delete. So let's have a look to the code. Please tell me if you can hear me because now I, I have to turn my head again. So let's go back. So we start, as I said, with the field definitions. These are the field definitions. As you can see, they are quite simple. Simple. We are defining two fields. Please note that we have prefixed them with a not module names, so we don't clash with possible other modules. And these, as I said, are base field definition, and we are just using this factory method to create an entity reference, setting a label, and setting revisionability. We don't need these in this specific example, but I wanted to show you this because um, it will make this property revisionable if revisionability is enabled on the user entity type. So if it makes sense for a prop, uh, the field to be revisioned. It should. It is a good thing to speci specify so even if it, the entity type is currently not revisionable. It will be just ignored if the entity type is not revisionable, but it will, it will be picked up when the entity type becomes revisionable, and you will get revisions for free. And the other field, the, so this field we will store the, the most recently created node, a reference for, for that node. And this other field will uh, store the, count, the node count, so the total amount of nodes created by the current user. Let's see now the wrapper I was talking about. Actually, this, this module is very simple. You wouldn't need all this stuff. I'm just trying to show you the best practices. Anyway, this is the wrapper. We have an interface, I won't show you because I have not enough space, but it's just defining these methods. And as you can see, in these methods, we actually don't do anything more than accessing the fields, the field values we need. So we have a field returning the node, the last created node, a field creating, returning the, the last created node ID because in some cases the node is deleted and so we don't have it, and we have the setters. Sorry. So then we have a service that's actually encapsulating all our logic. So we will act on node creation and node deletion to actually track the, the creation and deletion of the nodes. And so on creation, as you can see, we retrieve the node author. We retrieve the wrapper with this simple method. And then we set these properties. So we set the node that's been created and then we retrieve the count, and this is the interesting part. So in, we retrieve the count by expressing an aggregated entity query. This is an entity query, no more, no less, it's portable. And as you can see, the syntax is, is very sim similar to the dbtng one, but works on any storage backend. Once we got this count, we just save the user, and the data will end up in our new fields. Same for deletion. When we delete a node, we, we get the author, we check, we get the wrapper, and then we check that the deleted node is not the, the last created node of the user. If it is, we retrieve a new one, an updated one, through this other query. And as you can see, we have a new entity query even here, and this is simpler. It's just retrieving the identifier of the last created node, loading it and returning it. And then we, we set it as the new most recently created node. We set the count as we've seen before, and then we save, and we are done. And then we just have to retrieve the list of the entities to display. And this is the method used to do that. And it's, again, very simple. 
it's another entity query that has a condition on the status of the users of the count of the node count. We want only those that have created at least one node. And we have an entity relationship. So we are saying that we want to see only users that whose node, whose most recently created node is published. And this is translated to a join in SQL, but it could be translating to anything else. So let's see this in action. So we, first of all, we install the method, the, the module. And now we can have a look to the schema. As you can see now, we have two more fields. And these are our new fields. So let's create a couple of nodes and see what happens. This is our table, and it's empty because we have no content. Let's create one node. Bam. And then create another one. Where is it? Here it is. And our whole list is updated. And let's have a look to the storage. Here are our field values. And then we want to unpublish one node. Well, what you are going to see does not really make sense, but I wanted to display the power, showcase the power of the entity relationship. So now we have unpublished the, node, the most recently created node. It's gone. It's gone. And all of this, as you've seen it, is portable, you, it, as long as the storage began complies with the uh, entity query and entity storage API. This will work on any storage backend. And it's on SQL, it's very performant because it's just a query on a, a single table. OK. So this was one example. You can have uh, an applause if you want. <laughs> And now let me show you another funny one. Basically, now we will see an example of the entity updates I was talking about. So let me reset the situation here. So these are the update functions I was talking about. I've uh, disabled them for now because I want to install the module fresh without update functions applied and without changes. We are basically emulating the fact that we are providing two different versions of the same module. And actually, as you can see, so this is the change we are going to perform. We are going to alter the, a base field, the node title base field definition, and we are going to say that since we are very smart, we are going to use a multiple node title instead of single node title. So we're going to change its cardinality. So let's see what happens. So now we install the module and nothing is supposed to happen because nothing, the module does nothing by default. So let's have a look to the status report. So the status report is happy, okay? Now, we are going to uncomment this line and 
have a look to the status report again. Here it is. The, the system is complaining, and there's nothing you can do to resolve that issue aside from installing a more correct version of your code, which is providing a DB update function, which we will do in a second. Okay, let's have a look again. So now the warning is a, a, a bit more encouraging. We have a solution. <coughs> and let's have a look to what happens. Can you notice anything weird here? This is the node title dedicated table. And we don't have a node title column in the node field data anymore because this is a multiple base field. So now we want to see whether I'm cheating or whether this actually works. So let's check. See, apparently it works. Well, more or less works. <laughs> well, let's have a look to the database now. This is our node field data and no title in there because it's here. Here it is. And yes, now we want to restore the previous situation. As I told you, we cannot change the schema when there is data inside. So if in a real situation you would have to move your data to a temporary table, change the schema, and move it back to the new schema, all in a single update function. But since we don't have the time to do that, I will just delete the node for now. And I will restore the previous situation. So let's enable this update function. And let's comment this line again. Let's go back to the status report. This is very dangerous. So we have a new update. And it's gone again. And here it is, our note title. It's back again. So am I serious? Yes, am I serious? This is currently working in the eighth. That's a module you can find on GitHub. Uh, I will, there are the links in, uh, in a later slide. So you can just download the, the presentation slide uh, when, I'm, when we are done here, and there, there are a few useful links. There is the blog post link and a few links to the code if you want to have a closer look. So is this completely working? Apparently so, but yeah, we have still a few things to do. As I mentioned earlier, the table map mapping API is not completed yet. So uh, to actually switch table layouts for core entity types, we still need to do some work on the actual storage handlers of, I don't know, nodes, users, and, and stuff like that, because they actually, at the moment, assume the default table layout they come with. But the API already supports that, so as soon as we properly implement, actually, as we properly exploit the table mapping NTI, um, API in those storage handlers, then Core will be able to switch 
between this table layout and you will be, for instance, able to enable revisionability for users or tags or files or anything you want or translatability. Now, I think in core everything is translatable at the moment. I don't know why. And then we may need to define custom indexes and we have uh, an issue to add a hook making possible to alter the produced uh, schema array definition, schema API array definition and alter in specific hooks, uh, sorry, uh, specific indexes uh, we may need. And then we have another issue to um, allow to define initial values for fields. The typical example is uh, the file entity module that needs to add a bundle field to the file entity and needs also to provide a default value for those fields. Actually, the default value may not uh, it may not be the same of the actual default value, so we need an API allowing us to work consistently for both base fields and bundle fields and uh, provide an initial value for those. And then we need to support base field purging. At the moment, if your module, as we saw, if the active users module um, um, was, if we tried to <coughs> uninstall that module, and we didn't delete the content we created. The module could not be uninstalled because there is no base field purging ability and so the system just refuses to remove, uninstall a module that still has data. So if you want to help with that stuff, we have sprints on Friday. And uh, yeah, we, here you have um, some information useful if you need that. Get in touch with me, we can figure out what you can do to help. And yes, as you may have guessed, this is the end of the session. So the two takeaways, the two things you really need to remember of this session are those. Use the Entity Field API to define your data model and code your business logic around it. Leverage fields to store data and please, please avoid custom storage if you cannot help that. Uh, I'll always retrieve identifiers and load entities to access field data. The Entity Query API is very powerful, as you saw, and so you should, should use it as much as possible. So these are the useful links I was talking about, and I'd say we have five minutes for questions and answers. Or we can have a, a, a break. Ah, sorry, you need to walk to the microphone because the session is recorded, so otherwise uh, the people at home won't see, won't hear you. So, thank oh, okay. Uh, thank you, first of all, for this nice talk. I uh, just wanted to ask the... Uh, can you st stay closer to the mic because I can I can do like this. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, first of all, for this nice talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask if the... It's, it's, of course, possible to do the info alter hooks in YAML as well. So I've seen a lot of uh, sequential coding there. Could we go a little bit more to OOP? Well, uh, I'm not sure I understand correctly. Are you asking whether it's possible to alter that information also through YAML? Yeah, so do you just, uh, when installing, uh, use the uh, YAML schema on install? Actually, I'm not aware of any possibility of providing that information through YAML, so I would say no, actually. I think if you are really interested in that, you should build uh, your own thing that's, that actually implements uh, an alter hook and reads some YAML data and do, does its alterations based on that. But okay. I'm not sure what use cases uh, you have in mind. Deployability, maybe? No, you're just adding a certain fields to the user module. So if I wanted to add a new node, completely new node, I would not go and use info hooks, of course. Hooks. I would go and use the schema, YAML, for example, or the um, uh, annotation discovery, something like. So I thought about using this for your example. You use the user uh, uh, entity. So. Well, that sounds really interesting. We can talk about it later if you want, but actually I never tried to do something like that at the moment, so I'm not a proper answer, So Okay, no problem, thanks. Um, you were fiddling around with the title field before? Yep. And I was wondering what happens to the data, um, because you go from single value to multi-value, and logically you could copy over the data, 
But when you go back from multi-value to single value, what happens then? Is there data loss or does it well, just, you know? uh, as I said, you are in charge to deal with the data in that case. So it depends on you. If you think that that title looked nice that way and you just want to join the two values in a single string and store that, be my guess, but yeah, another possibility is just to lose the second value. It's, it's up to you. As I saw, as I displayed in those update functions, uh, you can do whatever you want here. Here, before these lines, you could uh, move all the data in a, let's say, temporary table, do the scheme alteration, and then here, move back the data from the temporary table again into the regular storage, and then you're done. So by default, it just deletes the data? No, by default, it refuses to proceed because if, you, if that, there's the data there, and that change will require a data migration, and the system will throw an exception. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, does this, this mean that we now have uh, revisionable users? Not yet. Uh, as uh, I was saying, we need to convert the user storage class to use uh, the table mapping API and perform its internal SQL queries in a way that's dynamic, that dynamically supports switching between the table layouts. Once we do that, and it, it's not actually that hard, we just didn't have time to do everything, uh, users may have revisionability. Okay, thanks. It's just, at that point, it's just a matter of implementing an info hook, an info alter hook, and marking user, user entity type as revisionable, and apply the update, obviously. Yeah, I just have a question. It's not a real use case, but I was just uh, a funny thought. Uh, what would happen if you changed uh, a schema to, for the UUID to be multi-value? I guess you will break many things, but <laughs> <laughs> I've never tried to do that. I think uh, don't do this at home is the proper answer. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm, I'm super excited about uh, this. Please closer uh, to the mic. Closer? Okay. Better, thanks. Okay. So this is super exciting. It's so exciting that I want to use it today when I'm still using Drupal 7, especially the entity query API, uh, doing queries on relationships, that's super awesome. So uh, is there something that would prevent m someone uh, to implement that in Drupal 7, apart from the fact that you have to assume that all the fields have to be in uh, the same storage? Well. Could it be done? Off the top of my head, I'd say it would be just an addition because it would be a matter of just supporting an, a new syntax. Actually, the, what we've done was uh, adding some join support, but the code is quite complex there. And, but I don't really think, I cannot really think about things that we've done that couldn't be done with dbtng. So I'd say it might be possible to provide an alternative uh, entity field query uh, backend that does that. You may want to talk with Chicks about that because he was the one that actually coded that part. Cool, awesome, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question. L sure, last question, uh, I'm afraid, because it's 2 p.m. Yeah, uh, about um, uh, the f bundle fields, yes, they are for the same for every part of the um, of the entity. Because at the moment in Drupal Seven, when you create a new field like image, it's shared between users and nodes. Yeah. In, in Drupal Eight, you will not share them between node and users, but you will share them between the node types, so or, or content types. Um, but you're prefixing also the table names, so the the pattern we have now for naming fields is shrinking. Do you know how how many Tekken, uh, how, many, how many characters you can have for uh, the machine name of fields? 
Uh, that's a good question. I don't remember the exact limit, but we have uh, an algorithm that will actually uh, append a hash of the, all the information, so we will never actually run out of the, of the limit. We will just lose the readability of the name after a certain amount of characters. Okay, so in the database it will work and it will look nice in the user face. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Oh, and one thing I always forget about. If you like this session, please go on that link and evaluate it. Thank you again. <laughs>